Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Church, I'm going to ask that you stand. I want to welcome everyone. Find your way, if you would find your way to your seats. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and we're going to worship together today. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us together again, Lord, to honor you, to worship you, God. Lord, I ask that you purify our hearts and our mind, that you would receive the sacrifice of worship and praise, Lord. Thank you that you've given us another day. We thank you for the next breath that we have that wasn't promised, Lord. We're here to magnify your holy name because you are worthy, you are holy, you are righteous. We thank you for your glorious wonders and your works, God. We praise you for the work of your hand, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I ask that your hand be upon everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to get started. Sing with us, church. Yeah. 
Praise the Lord, too. Amen. Oh, I love it. I love it. I just want to take a quick second. Thank everyone. Was, we have a small crew, and Jobe's a little new to uh, helping out. And I think, you know, everyone came together and just gave their best. And I, you know, I just want to acknowledge all the unseen back there, the sound people. There's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of help that goes on behind the scenes that we don't see that may go unnoticed or unacknowledged. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. Before we go into this next song, I just feel the need to clarify something because, thank you, brother. I got to catch my breath too. Because the, the, our culture has created this image of Jesus that, that isn't the God that the Bible talks about. See, the Jesus that the world talks about is a sissified Jesus, if I can be blunt. The Jesus that we see in the picture with this flowing hair, skin that looks like it's never worked a day in his life. But my God, Jesus was a carpenter. And if you've ever seen a man who works with his hands, they got some rough skin. I mean, it scratches and they, you know, callous, yes, is the word. Thank you. And I want to read something here because the Bible gives us a very clear picture of the God that we serve. Revelation chapter 19 and starting at verse 11, it says, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a rope dipped in blood and his name called the word of God. 
And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, God, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the God that we serve. And I want that image in your heart, in your mind, as we sing this next song, The Lion and the Lamb. I want you to think about, that's the God that we serve. He's not a sissy. He judges and he makes war. And it gets me that we would that we would see God pour his wrath on his own son, but he would let you slide. He deserves more than what we could give. And I know this song is an upbeat song, but I want that image in your heart and your mind as we sing and we praise. Praise with us today, church. Come on. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb 
blood that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the shame. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. Oh, yes, we know. No king, king, no king. Isaiah 41 says, says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, the God of armies. You're the one who fight for us, God. In our battles, the battle is yours, Father. Oh, it's by my 
Come on, somebody. <laughs> if you don't know the Holy Ghost is in this place, you need to check yourself for a pulse this morning. God is in the house, and His Spirit is here with us here today. Wow. You guys want to sing that one more time? Because I know I want to hear it one more time. I mean, I had to open my eyes. I was like, oh, man, I'm in church. I forgot. I was in another realm right now. How about you? Let's go back. Let's go back to that again. Let's sing that song again. Come on. Come on. Just separate yourself just a little while longer, church. Close your eyes and just worship him. Come on. Hallelujah. You're welcome to come to the front if you want and just worship Christ this morning.
Hallelujah. Father, we come before you this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. What a sweet spirit, Father God, in this place today. Precious Lamb of God, accept our offering of worship this morning. Let it be a sweet smell. Let the fragrance, Father God, fill this place with your healing virtue, Father God, your deliverance. Set the captives free here today, O oh God. Be anxious for nothing here this morning. Father, we just want to praise you and thank you for all that you've done, for all that you're going to do, Father God. Your promises are yes and amen. And we thank you here today for victory. Victory over our lives, Lord God, our mental state, our physical state. We thank you, Father God, for, big, for, for unbelief, Father God, that you've taken it away just through worship here today. Because we lack at times, Father. And you're here to fill our cups, and you've made it overflow this morning. And we're blessed here today by your presence, oh God. Fill our cups here today even more, Lord God. Let them overflow in the mighty name of Jesus. We bless you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. Not bad, guys. Not bad. <laughs> Amen. How many of you needed that? You needed that. You know, the Lord had me sing them a song, sing the song one more time, just to show you, church, that we just need to slow down. We need to slow down just a little bit from life and remember whose presence we're in. You know, when he looked at the thief on the cross and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. He's telling you the same thing here today because in paradise there's safety. There's no fear. Paradise was a place in the king's court where if you were walking with the king, and even if you weren't, you wore a robe, which represented you knew the king intimately. And if you were walking there, no one could touch you. No devil, no demon, nothing. It was a place of complete peace, joy, no sorrow, no more tears. He told us, I will wipe away every tear. Amen? And that's what he's come here to do today. The Lord is with us. And with God before us, who could be against us, church? We've already won, and we have to get that mentality this morning. We've already won. We just got to internalize that. Amen. Welcome this morning to Breakthrough Community Church. We are blessed to have you here today. Is there anybody this morning for the very first time? We have any first time visitors here today? We have welcome. Welcome. Welcome here. Welcome. <laughs> Amen. We're all family here today. Praise God. Go ahead and take a few minutes this morning and greet one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you.
All right, good morning. If you guys could find your seats. Break it up. We got some stuff to take care of. Well, welcome, family. It's good to be here. What an awesome worship. Amen. So you're supposed to take out your phones and check in into the Breakthrough Community Church on your uh, Facebook thing. I don't have a Facebook, but if you do, let people know where you're at. You're allowed to get on your phone right now, and that's it. After that, put them away. And let them know that they can come and join us. All right, so I have an, and I hate to do this announcement again. So the children's church is in need of teachers still. I want, I want, I want to help uh, maybe do a realignment in our way of thinking. You serving in the church isn't doing the Lord a favor. Amen? You know, I'm, I'm sitting here watching our worship team, you know, and our drummer and the singers up here, they're also the, the youth leaders, right? I mean, these people are doing a lot of different things in the church. You know, um, Adrian and Lisette, they also do a, a Spanish Bible study. It's all the same people doing a lot of stuff. We need your help. And it's an honor and a privilege to serve your king. So we need teachers. And, and I, I, I'll give you the Rich Gorsland guarantee that we will make sure that you're prepared. You know, it's maybe do it once a month or whatever, whatever you can do to help. And they'll teach you. They'll prepare you. Everything will be done and ready for you. You just got to show up and do it. So please, if, if you're not serving in the church, you need to be because it's probably the same 25 people doing everything. And so this is what we do for the Lord. This isn't. You know, this isn't just to show up and get entertained. Amen? All right, on a, on a sweeter note. <laughs> Coffee Talk by Luciano and Josie Saldano is having a movie night and word to help strengthen our marriages on Saturday the 19th at 7 p.m. It'll be at Harkins, Estrella Falls, 16. Man, Estrella. That's not close to here, right? All right, I'll have to leave early. $30 per couple. See Luciano and Josie for more information. All right, so see, they're doing stuff. They're setting this stuff up. They're getting ready, right? They're, they're bringing us in, trying to help us with our marriages. We are starting a 21-day fast. Oh, no. I mean, yes. Woo! Does this look like a body that fasts? I mean, let's be completely honest with ourselves. Last time we did it, I told my wife I'm going to fast from taking out the trash and broccoli. So I'll try to do something more spiritual this time. But on, well, so we're starting the fast on March 27th. Devotions, prayer focus will be posted on the uh, BCC Facebook page. So if this is your first time not eating <laughs> you can, uh, and you have any health issues, please don't feel obligated to ask, but ask God and uh what he would have you fast from, right? So my wife and I, we fasted from TV for a year. Just because I'd rather eat than watch TV. <laughs> See, that's what I'm going to be honest with you. It's just, it is who it is. I don't know. All right, well, we would like you all to join us on Wednesdays. Our Wednesday Bible studies have been really good. Amen. And we've been very disciplined in making it one hour. That's the only, all, and all you have to be here is one hour, okay? So it's, it's uh, seven to, to eight, and uh, please come. And it's, it's, we're really working on it, trying to expand things, trying to um, do some new things, you know, learn some things that maybe not just Bible studies, but application studies in your real life. So please come out. Amen? All right. If you need a prayer card or tithing envelope, raise your hands. Oh, yeah, and while you're raising your hands, I just want to say one more time that we have a prayer email. Now, it's been put on the bottom of the page on the BCC um, webpage. It'll be on the bottom for prayer requests, okay? They go to Celine. Yeah, right here. So if you don't have it, don't write it down or whatever. Just go on there. You click on it. It'll take you right there to send a message. So if anybody you know or you have any prayer requests, they go to Celine, and then Celine. We'll take them, and then we'll have, we have a group of people that have volunteered. And if you want to volunteer to be in that group of people, she'll send it out to prayer warriors to pray for you. 
right? We'll, they'll be all be on our WhatsApp or whatever. So if you have any questions about any of it, please see Celine, raise your hand. See Celine, please. All right? There she is doing something else. Amen. And there's a lot of people in this church that do a lot. I mean, th this church door is ain't open without Marcos being here. I mean, he's here for everything, up there doing the sound and stuff. The people up there, I mean, Monica's doing the words up there for us, and she's teaching kids, and she's doing ushering. And this, and there's, I, I hate, I shouldn't start naming names because I'll be like pastor, and I'm going to forget somebody, and then I'm going to get in trouble later. But Shyla, everybody, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing group of people. Help them out. All right, so there are several ways to give at BCC. You can give online at BreakthroughPeoria.com or by downloading the Tithe.ly app directly to your phone. If you'd like to mail it in, your tithes and offerings, the address will be on the screen and also posted in the comments on the live feed and Facebook. So is it the right address? Okay, there's no address on the, on the screen right now. But if you go out in front of the building, there'll be an address. <laughs> Send it to that, all right? And it's on Facebook, those of you who are on Facebook. But now you're off Facebook, right, because we already did that. Amen. The ushers would come up. Amen. Look, more people who do other things in the church other than usher. Look at that. Amen. I just want to, I want to say I looked up on tithing, and I looked it up, and it, it sickens me to find out that 5% of the American church tithes. Five percent. And I know the, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, but it's also a requirement. They said 77 percent of the people who do tithe give above and beyond their tithe. And because the, the reason for that is, is because they have learned that God's word is true, that you give on to him and he'll give back to you and you give on. You cannot outgive him. I promise you, I will give you testimonies in my own life that you absolutely cannot outgive God. So, Heavenly Father, we just ask you, Lord, help us. Put us in a position, Lord. Put our minds in a, in a place, Lord, where we know that all things are for you. That we're not giving you our money. We're giving you your money, Lord. You ask for only 10%. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for so much. And we thank you for those who give today, those who are faithful, Lord. I just pray blessing over them, Lord. And those who are struggling, Father, I just pray you help them, show them, equip them. Have them reach out for help, Lord. Let us not be prideful. We love you, and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. So we're going to take communion, if you'll get your communion ready. And I just want to read out of John 6. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, 
which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Why did Jesus use the words of eating his flesh and drinking his blood? We know that we do it symbolically, but why? When we are saved and born again, we are feeding upon the bread, the body of Christ. When we read our Bible, we are fed. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we are fed. When we hear a lesson or a sermon that helps us, we are fed. When we walk and talk with God, we are fed. In all these ways, we are feeding upon the bread, upon the flesh of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1 of John, it tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Jesus is still telling us today, just as he told his disciples at the Last Supper, to take, eat, this is my body. When we partake of communion, it represents, number one, the understanding of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Number two, it represents when we are saved. At communion, we should always thank God for saving our souls and ask him to forgive us of all of our sins. It is a time for self-reflection. Number three, it represents an ongoing relationship that includes the blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And number four, it represents the spiritual strength that we gain by feeding upon the flesh of Christ. He is the bread of life. Hold up your bread. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, will you take a moment? And give thanks to the Lord for what he did at Calvary, for your salvation, for the blood that cleanses you and washes you clean, that you can stand here today and take another breath. He broke it. Break your bread. Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make your souls free from sin. For the blood makes you free from sin because of the life in it. I was thinking about the blood and how it functions. 
there's three main parts of blood. There's the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. The red blood cells, they are what carry oxygen to every tissue of our body. And they pick up the carbon dioxide. They take it back to the lungs and we breathe it out. I want you to imagine the life that's in the blood. Jesus forgives our sins and he comes in and he brings life to every part of our body and every tissue of our body. And he carries away the sin, the darkness, the evil that tries to destroy us. The white blood cells, they are our fighter cells. And there's different types of white blood cells. And depending on what they're for, it's bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic infections. They will destroy. It also protects us from mutated cells such as cancer. The blood is the life. Jesus, in our spiritual life, cuts away the cancer that tries to destroy us. The platelets are the main function. It's, uh, their main function is blood clotting. It's to stop the bleeding of a wound. When I partake of communion, it reminds me that Jesus still heals today. He stops the bleeding of our wounds, of our emotional hurts and pains. No matter when they happen to you, you carry them with you. And Jesus, every time you take communion, those wounds. He stops the bleeding and he is our emotional healer. 1 Corinthians 11.25 Hold up your cup. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We remember you today, Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Let's drink. Heavenly Father, thank you for the body and the blood that you gave your son to die for us. That we can come and be made whole. That your blood cleanses us from all sin. That we can eat of your body and grow spiritually, Lord. And you will cut away the hurts and the pains and you will still heal us today. And I pray, Father, that we will always do this in remembrance of you, Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Look at that person next to you. Tell them it's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. (laughs) We don't need to do it sarcastically. Oh, well, it's good to see you today in the house of the Lord. (laughs) Uh Some people are just like, "Mm." all right, it's okay. Remember what you were doing yesterday and the day before. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about a, it's a topic that I think uh, will minister to all of us. I know it ministers to me constantly, and uh, if you want to put a title to this morning's sermon, it's Trusting God. Now, easier said than done, isn't it? So if you have your Bibles with you this morning now, I'm going to be reading from the NIV, but up here they're going to have uh, the New King James, if I'm not mistaken, so... Uh, It may read just a little bit differently. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. Now, we're familiar with one scripture in particularly in this portion right here, right? When uh, when we tell somebody, hey, don't be 3-5 in it. What are we telling them? Don't lean on your own understanding, right? So we're going to read through the whole thing through verses 1 through 10. The Word of God reads, My son... 
Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands, where? In your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love, faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, do what? Submit or acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. The Lord, fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with all your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then the barn, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. This last portion of scripture here kind of reminds me of the fast that we're going to be doing. Now, I know some of you are like, oh man, a fast, right? But we're going to be doing, we're gonna, it's going to be a Daniel fast, okay? It's a 21-day Daniel fast. We're doing it. It's going to lead right up to, um, to Resurrection Sunday, okay? Um, which at that time, hopefully, uh, I mean, I would like to, I know this may sound kind of strange, but we're going to end our fast on Resurrection Sunday the day before, and hopefully we might be just like roasting a pig, so I know it's kind of going from one extreme all the way. T- so if we get sick, th- that's going to be why. It's not going to be because of the pig. <laughs> it's because of all the healthy eating we've been doing, and then we're going to eat a pig, right? So I'm just putting a disclaimer in there right now, okay? But it is a, it's a fruit and vegetable fast that we're going to be doing. And, um, you know, every time we do this, and I'll tell you what, man, I just, you know, the Holy Spirit moves. The Holy Spirit moves during this time, and, and, uh, you know, when we deny ourselves of certain things, um, it's just more room for the Holy Spirit to fill us up. Amen. So in this portion of scripture here, um, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, there's some words of wisdom for us on our relationship with God. Now, we get saved, delivered, and set free, and we're on this spiritual high, but then comes testings after a while because I don't know about you, but when, when I first gave my life to the Lord, Man, I was just on this high, this spiritual high. I thought I was invincible. I thought, man, Lord, this is so good to be here. And then, boom, a trial hits, right? And that's where the Lord begins to, to say, okay, I want you to trust me now. I've saved you and set you free. Now the trust test comes in, right? So he'll allow some things to take place in our lives. So this morning, there's a couple questions that we're going to have for you here today. The first question is, how can I know God's will? I can't tell you how many times somebody has asked me, Pastor, how do I find out what God's will is for my life? Time and time again. The second question, how can I be a success for God, for others, and for myself? Well, I'll tell you. That's being a good steward or a good manager. So it's, it boils back down to trust. Trusting God. We need to trust God in the little. We need to trust him in everything, not just miracles and different things like that, but in every little thing we need to trust God. Growing his kingdom and myself as a steward or a manager of his possessions, like Rich was talking about, we need to be a steward because everything belongs to him. It's almost as if somebody lent me a million dollars and one day they asked for me for 20 bucks. Would I give it to them? Of course I would, because they blessed me more than I could ever bless them. So when they require something of me or you, then we should give it. You see, God has given you something that money cannot buy. Amen? He's given you the riches of the next kingdom that awaits us. The streets are going to be paved of gold. I don't know about some of you guys, but I eat dust all the time right here. If you open the door to my house right here, you'll see dust. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) You know, but there, there's not going to be anything like that. But you see, that's the 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 life that I want to uh, invest in. Amen. So I have to trust him here with what he's given me. Amen. What he's given me to manage or be a steward over. Proverbs 3, 1, it says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. 
So this proverb writer begins to tell us about this relationship with God, and he's talking here about complete obedience. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I have seen complete obedience for this whole entire week with all the people that came by to help out with the wedding stuff, the cleanup crew, the worship team, the sound people. I mean, what a better day than today to acknowledge all those people that have been here working so diligently throughout this entire week. Obedience to God. Why do they come every day after work? Why do they stay late when they need to wake up at 3, 4, or 5 o'clock in the morning? Why do we do these things? Complete obedience to God. I'll tell you something. There are days, me and Angie, we, we go down and lie down in the bed. We look at each other like, how on earth are we still awake? How are we still alive today right now? We come in and we're just like. <laughs> right? Right, babe? I'll tell you what, our ibuprofen 800s are running down to a little minimum. <laughs> but you know what? The Lord every morning freshens us, gives us strength. And I recognize and realize it's not the ibuprofen 800s. It's not. Amen? It's the Holy Ghost. Gives us strength for the next day to serve with joy, to serve with compassion. So I thank all of you that were here these last four or five days and even before that. Because, you know, like Rich was saying as well, um, there is a group of people that no matter what, they're here. Amen? This church does, it, trust me, this church is not operated by me. Amen. I do the preaching. I do some other things here and there. But there is a group of people. I'll tell you what, if you're one of those people that was here yesterday, the day before and for the wedding and all that, stand up real quick for me. Come on, stand up. Don't be shy. It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Keep standing. Keep going. There's other people and they're serving right now over in the nursery. They're teaching our kids. And, you know, uh, if you can see how many stand up as opposed to other people, um, you can join that. You can be a part of that. Because we don't come to church, amen, just to hear, do we? It is better to be doers of the word, not just hearers only, amen. So I think, Gabe, thank you. I mean, our kids are going to be well insulated this summer, <laughs> amen. Gabe has worked very hard all week, amen. And his son, Mike, came to help. Freddie was in there. I'm just glad nobody got electrocuted, shocked. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, Thomas helped out, too. Thank you very much for your service, you guys. Uh, like I said, I'm so blessed. Amen. As a pastor here, you guys are making it happen. So thank God for that. That's part of being obedient to God and trusting God that he's going to take care of your time. Your time has been managed well. Amen. You cannot go wrong by serving God. So in this portion of scripture here, the results of obedience to God is found in verse 2. It says, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Verse 3, let love, faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You see, he's talking about love. He's talking about loyalty, being at the very center of your life. Why do we serve? Because we love. Why do we love? Because he loved us. That's why we serve. He loved us. Did he love you in your best state of mind? Amen? No. He came in when nobody else would and when nobody else did. And he took us under his righteous right hand. What did we have to offer him when we stepped at the altar that day? When we knelt before him? We had nothing but bad things to offer him. And you know what I love about God is he wiped our slate clean. His mercies are new every morning. Can you imagine that? A clean slate on a daily basis. Verses 5 and 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Not some of them, but all of them. Submit to him and he will make your path straight. Why does he need to make our path straight? Because we're good at crooked roads. We're good at being crooked. Right? Right? We're good at being shady and not always like thieving and things like that. But we don't always take his path and whatever his path is and we don't take it is crooked. It could be little things, tiny things. But he wants to make our path straight. You know, when I have a car and I'm driving down a straight road, 
Sometimes I like to see what that car can do. I'm not going to lie. But when I'm on the straight path with Jesus, I want to see what he can do in my life. Because he's made that road straight, which means I can see far ahead because of what he's shown me. Amen? I don't have to be aware of a, a curve coming around here or there because he's shown me the way. And he's leading the way. And I can have full assurance in him that he's going to lead me on the right path, a straight path. The proverb writer tells us if we do these things, that he will clear the road for us to follow. In other words, uh, he's going to help those hurdles along life that come. You, you guys familiar with hurdles of life? Yeah? He'll take some of those away. He'll take some of those away. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Never think that we are wise enough, but respect God and stay away from evil. If we do this, it says here in the Bible, in these verses, that he will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruit of all your crops. We got any farmers in the house? I didn't think so. Right? So we're like, oh, the crops, this means the first fruits before taxes, before all those things. Honor God with everything because it all belongs to him. In other words, he lets us keep 90%. <laughs> Simply put. It's simple math, right? We don't need to go further on with that. Do you notice here in these portions of scriptures that there's no exceptions? He didn't say that word to partially obey. The Lord's teaching and instructions. He didn't say that we have to give a most of our heart. That we're to trust him certain times, certain days, certain hours. No. But if we keep these words that he tells us here, um, then those commands that he's giving, they come with a promise. You know, I love this one thing about God is that he always keeps his promise to me. And he'll always keep his promise to you. He's not a man that he would lie. What does he got to lose? Nothing. But these promises, they do come with conditions, don't they? We do our part. He does his part. If we trust him completely, if we obey him completely, then he will make provision for you. Will it be in your timing? Will it be with your resources? Will it be with your head knowledge? No. Why? Because God is trustworthy. He's worthy of our trust. He will never let you down. I've been young and I'm getting old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No begging for bread. Amen. God comes in right in the neck of time. God has entrusted or placed within our care the possessions, the opportunities, the talents and time that we experience now here today. We're trustees of everything that God has given us. So the car you drive, the house you live in, the apartment, whatever it is, you have because God has allowed you to have it. Amen? Are we grateful for those things? Do we treat those things as if we are grateful? I think sometimes, you know, when I turn on my wife's car, there's a, a red light that's been coming on. It just started not too long ago, and it says service. And then I push a little button. And you know what? The, the, the sad part about this is that that little right light started off like amber, like a warning. Amen. And now it's red. Which means you're getting close to something going on here. But we do that with our spiritual walk. We can be on yellow for a very long time. A check engine light can come on. I mean, some people I know will have a check engine light on until it's time to go through emissions again. And then they'll fix it right before they go through emissions. We do that in our spiritual walk, church. We walk around. If you're not serving in the church or God's people, and guess what? Your check engine light is on now. I don't know if it's yellow. I don't know if it's red, but it's on. And you know what you need? You need to service it. You need to maintain it. You need to take care of that issue so that goes away. I don't know about you, but I don't like those lights being on. It bothers me every time I go to turn the car on and I see it. And I'm just like, sometimes I don't. Honestly, I'll put something sometimes in front of it. But we do that too, don't we? We mask that issue, that problem, that sin, 
that relationship, that financial issue, right? We cover up the service soon sign in our spiritual walk. We're going to look at some of these questions here today that that we often ask. Do I trust God in big things and not in small things? Or do I trust him in small things, but with big things I don't? I just want to be in control. I want to be in charge of this because nobody can do it better than I can. If I want things done right, I'll do them myself. And we forget all about God. Is there any controlling people here? No, I don't see any either, Rich. Oh, wait, there's one. (laughs) No, I'm going to have people after service. Pastor, were you looking at me? (laughs) Because it's not me, it's my wife, my husband, right? When we're going through uh, looking at that, we're going to turn the tables around. Do I trust God? Can I trust God? Now, another question is not only can I trust God or do I trust God, but does God trust me? Mm. I don't know if I've ever asked myself, does he trust me? Not just can he trust me, but does he trust me? Have I proven to be a worthy servant unto him? Can he give me what he wants to, knowing that I am trustworthy? Or am I one of these people who are trustworthy in some areas, but in other areas, God says, I cannot touch this area in your life because you're not yet trustworthy. I can't give you that promotion because you're not a good steward of your money or your time now. I can't raise you to the next level in ministry because you're not doing anything in ministry. I just want to lead. I just want to preach. Well, can you clean the restroom real quick? Oh, no, I don't do that. (laughs) You know, I want to give props to the person that cleans the restroom over there. You know who that person is? No, huh? I'm not going to tell you who that person is. But somebody cleans that one and the other one every single week. Amen? It doesn't matter if they're recognized. You want me to tell you who it is? Do you guys want to know? Me. I only say that not to pump myself up, church, but to say that there is no position, no thing that we can do here at church for God that is below us or above us. There isn't. Amen? I'm not trying to puff myself. If you guys know me, you know I don't do stuff like that. I want you to know that there is nothing beyond anything that anybody can do here. We have people doing construction work here that are not construction workers. Amen? Why? Because they've made themselves available. They are trustworthy people to God. Is he going to use the professional all the time? No, but he'll use the available every time. Amen? Here's some trustworthy thoughts about God. God's care is constant. Constant. How many of you guys got a crazy kid? And you know what? When we have a crazy kid, we're always constantly watching because we don't know what they're going to get into next. Right? God's care is constant. His care is constant for you. Because some of you are that crazy kid, no matter how old you are. Amen? Now, when it comes to trusting God, can we rest assured that he gives us the right uh, constant, consistent care? Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says this. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So you can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Amen. What can man do to me? That's a great promise that God gives us. Literally, in the original language, it says this way. I will not, no, not leave thee, neither will I forsake thee. God's care is constant. There's a reason why we're not dead. Because his care is constant. He's always watching out for you and I. Five times here, God wanted to reassure us that he's not going to leave us. God constantly cares for us. And because of that, Peter can tell us that we're to cast all our cares, cast all our anxiety and our worries upon him because he is constant. He's not a sporadic God. Oh, I'm going to do this one day. I don't think I feel like doing that the next. 
You know that nobody can touch you or touch me. Nothing, no demon, no devil, no person can do anything to any of us unless they touch God first. That's what I'm talking about. They have to ask permission to a holy, righteous God. Now, some of us think, well, that's kind of strange that God would do that, but I don't think it's strange at all. Because if God is allowing something in my life, then I know that he's trying to get my attention and there's an area in my life that needs change. And we'll talk about that here shortly. So most of you guys know of the poem Footprints, correct? You know, the, the, the sand. and So do any of you guys know the backstory of how that came to be? No? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right here real quick. This lady's name was Margaret Fishbeck. She went through a lot, a lot of trials, okay? First of all, the person that she loved left her. Shortly after that, she caught meningitis and was little, literally bedridden for months and months. She came to the lowest point in her life, and during that lifetime, another man fell in love with her and wanted to marry her, but she wouldn't marry him. She basically said, I'm out of trust. I'm not sure if, you can, if I can even trust God, let alone man. I'm just out of trust. That's a hard thing to, to, to gain back, isn't it, when we got burned time and time and time again. Well, some of us feel like we got burned by God. But this woman here, one night in her diary, she was laying in bed and she was writing in it. She began to write the beautiful piece, Footprints. And that night she saw the answer. And I'll read this to you, how she came about with footprints. She read here, One night a man had a dream, and he dreamed that he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes of his life. And for each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other belonging to the Lord. After the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. And he also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and the very saddest times of his life. And that bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. He said, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand, Lord. Why, when I needed you the very most, would you leave me? And the Lord repri- replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. I would never leave you. And during your tri- times of trial and suffering, when you seen one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Amen? It was then that I carried you. Some of us came in that way. And you know why you're at church today? Because he carried you. He brought you. He wooed you to come today. God not only constantly cares for us, but he's generous. His love, his, uh, uh, basically everything he does is because of love, but he's generous with that love, isn't he? He gives us more than we can even handle at times. Now, if you're taking notes here this morning, I want you to write down Psalms 136. To look at Psalms 136, maybe read it later on today. But I'll read just some portions here and there from Psalms 136. Praise the Lord, for he is good. God's love never fails. Praise to God of all gods, because God's love never fails. Praise praise the Lord of lords. God's love never fails. Only God works great miracles. God's love never fails. With wisdom, he made the sky. God's love never fails. The Lord stretched the earth over the ocean. God's love never fails. So how do we develop our trust with God? How does he develop his trust uh, for, I don't know, let me back up here a second. How does God develop our trust for him? Does anybody know? Adversity trials that's how he does it because when a doctor tells you something you think it's the last say but we don't serve doctors do we we serve the god who has the last say he has the last say he's the divine physician his promises are yes and amen his 
delight is he delights in seeing us healed. Don't you think he does? Don't you know when your child is hurting and they have a breakthrough or they get healed? Don't you delight in that? He doesn't delight in seeing us hurting church. He will allow it so that we come back to him because that's truly in that book. Secrets of the secret place. um, Man, there's so many chapters in that book where we see that God allows things in our life to happen. Disastrous things at times because that's when we draw closest to God. Our valley experiences is when we cry out, Abba. Amen? So he does this, uh, developing our trust with ad- adversity. We're responsible to trust him in times of adversity, but we're, all, we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit to enable us to do so. In uh, Psalms chapter 56, verse 4, this is what David said. For in God I trust, I will not be afraid. And in Psalms 34, he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. What's David saying? You and I are responsible for trusting God. He does his part. We need to do our part. It's as simple as that, right? There's where the conflict comes in. Now hang out with me here just for a second. Here's our problem. God asks us to obey or to trust him in area in areas of our life that are bigger than we could ever reason or understand. And instead of doing our part, which is total trust and obedience, we want to get over to God's side. I got this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to handle it my way. And that's where the issues start to come in. We want to say, now, God, if, if, I, if, if I do this, how are you going to work it out? If I really let you have my marriage... It's almost like, God, you don't understand all the problems I've got in marriage. You don't know this man. You don't know this woman. We're talking to the creator of the man and the woman. Right? God, if I surrender this financial issue to you, I'm not you, I'm sure you even understand finances, God. We don't say it, but we do it. Right? When we don't trust him. I'm not really sure, God, if you understand how deep my problems go. You see what that person did to me. See? You have to understand something. God not only seen it, amen, but you haven't seen how he's going to deal with that person. You see, we want to take vindication sometimes. We want to pay back. I'll show you, right? But that's God's business and not ours. He's the one who pays back. I would rather get paid back by man personally than by God. (laughs) Because what can he do? Right? It's simple. I think this is why our Lord said we have to be like little children. Right? We have to be like little children to get into heaven. The simplicity, the willingness to be vulnerable. Now, many of us, you know, grew up in some rough, rough times, rough areas, a rough families, right? And so we have a problem because of a mentality that was given to us way back um, that Vulnerability is weakness. And it is. And that's how we're to come to the Lord. Vulnerable. Lord, you see my mess. You see my life. You see my parenting. You see my finances. You see my heart. I need help. I need you. I don't have all the answers. I've asked everybody but you. How many times do we make a phone call before we go to prayer or our prayer closet? (laughs) Right away, we go into panic mode. We start, Pastor, and uh, and Rich, and uh, and Rob, uh, and Johnny, and uh, and we start doing all these things, right? That's one of the first questions I ask somebody. Have you prayed? Have you even sought the Lord in this manner? Because I won't always have the answer. Amen? Johnny either. Rich either, Sherry either. We don't always have the answer. Why is my child so sick? Why did, my, why did this person pass? And, you know, really the only thing we can offer to you many times is comfort and consolation and say, you know what, God is good and he's sovereign. We can't un- I mean, if we could figure out God, then he wouldn't be God. <laughs> right? If we could understand who he is and why he does the things that he does, he would not be God. But he is. And he doesn't answer to us, we answer to him. It's as plain and simple as that. So, how does God develop our trust? The first thing was adversity. Oh, 
Man, I, that's, that's a hard one right there, even just to get past that one, right? Adversity in our lives. We have to make ourselves vulnerable. But you know how else he does? He tests us when we have plenty, when things are going really, really good. Don't you love those seasons? I love those seasons. I'm like, man, thank you, Jesus. Things are going smooth. The church is operating more like a well-oiled machine. We're moving forward. Uh, the Holy Spirit's showing up. The worship is awesome. You know, everybody's behaving. You know, it's awesome. Kumbaya. <laughs> Right? Amen? Those are good times. I love those times. I cherish those times. But I know that there is going to come a time when the ministry is tested. Amen? And so I want to make sure that my uh, relationship with the Lord, the church's relationship with the Lord, that's why we'll talk about certain topics that we talk about. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I listen to or watch certain people preaching on TV, I, I, you know, I'll turn on the channel every once in a while and be like, let's see what they have to say today. And, you know, I see patterns of churches that are not even talking about sin. And I don't understand. I'm like, there's a whole other side to serving God. Sin issues come up. How is it that they're not bringing these things up? They're not talking about the, the things that people are doing today in society. The gay marriages and all the other things, transgender, all those things that are coming out right now as the norm. Church, can I tell you something? That's not normal. One man, one woman. We just married a couple this weekend. A couple. Not a third. There was no thirds. There was no likes, right? We will preach on those topics. Abortion. We will mention those things. Amen. We will talk about those things because we know what our word says. And we have to be a complete church. Will we pay the price for it? There's probably a reason why we're not this huge giant mega church. But that's okay. That's all right with me. Amen. God knows what he can trust us with, right? We have to be careful when we have plenty. To the extent to which we genuinely thank God for the blessings he provides, it's an indicator of our trust in him. This area becomes real difficult because when we're blessed, there's a tendency to either trust in ourself or in our blessings. You're like, what, what does that even mean? Well, I'm going to show you something here. We have to remember that God is our source, first of all, correct? So I noticed something here in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. There's a contrast here. People who trust in God and people who trust in themselves or their possessions. Here's what it says. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Now listen to what he says here. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. And they imagine it a wall too high to scale. What's he saying here? He's saying that those who trust in the Lord, when they have an issue or a need, they immediately run to God. And he is their trust. But those who have their uh, possessions, they make for themselves a fortified city. And they look at that fortified city and say, it's an unscalable wall. I cannot be touched behind it. It's a wall behind it. What's your unscalable wall today? Is it your college degree? Is it your savings account? Is it your job? Is it your health? See, it's very easy for us to put our trust in those things and not make God the source and the platform for our trust. It's like the guy who said, God, it just seems like I cannot lean on you like I want. And God is telling this person, it's because you've never put your total weight on me. Hmm. Sometimes we'll lean on God, but we kind of keep our strength in our fortified tower. Our education. But he wants, and you know, it's scary to put your total weight on something, isn't it? Right? You guys ever be uh, close to a fence, and you're going to lean on it, and you feel it move a little bit, and you're like, whoa. Right? And then you stop having trust in fences for a little while. But you can lean on God. And when you do, you can put your total trust and your total weight on him. His burden is easy, and his yoke is light. Amen? I'm going to close this portion of scripture here with a quote. It's a little lengthy quote. 
But I love the quote. I love the minister that ministered this quote. His name is Dr. S.M. Lockridge. I don't know if you guys know who he is. I'm going to talk about trust here. And all worship team, if you can be ready, I'm going to give you a look when it's time to come up. And I want you, it's going to be hard for you, Jesus, back there, because I think once I get going here, uh, it, it, you know, you're going to see who God is. Amen? God is the one who made us. It is he who made us and we, not ourselves. The heavens declare his glory. And the firmament shows his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love. And no far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. I'm telling you today, church, you can trust him. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. And he's immor immortally grateful, graceful. He's impartially, impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever lived or ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. He does not have to call for help, and you can't confuse him. He doesn't need you, and he doesn't need me. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He is unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is supreme. He is preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem of higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of truth. He's the cardinal necessity of the spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. You can trust him. He can satisfy all your needs, and he can do it simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he sees. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the people. He blesses the young and he regards the age. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the path of peace. He's the roadway of the righteous. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. He's the master of the mighty, the capturer of conquerors. He's the head of heroes. He's the leader of legislatures. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors, the prince of peace. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough and his grace is sufficient. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. His reign is righteous. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable because he's incomprehensible. He's irresistible because he's invincible. You can't get him off your hands. You can't get him off your mind. You can't live without him and you can't outlive him. Death couldn't handle him. And thank God the grave couldn't hold him. There's nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. He has no predecessor. He has no successor. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. You can trust him. He's the alpha. He's the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the first of all things. He's the giver of life. He's the joy out of every sorrow. He's the light of every darkness. He's the peace that surpasses all. All understanding, he's the giver of every good thing, every perfect gift. Church, you can trust him. There's no God before him. There will be none after him. He is the first, the last, the preeminent. There is no other God. Come on, church, let's praise him this morning. Trust. The Lord has placed more than just this sermon today on trust. And only God knows why he does that. Do you trust him, church, with everything that you have? We say yes. While they're preparing here to sing, do a self-assessment right now. And ask yourself, do I trust God in every area of my life? Do I? What area do I have right now that God is showing me I need help in? 
What area am I self-reliant in here today? Many of us struggle with trust because we've been let down time and time again. You can trust God with everything that you have. Everything, literally everything that you have. His timing is impeccable. Never early, never late. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. If you're tired, if you're weak, I want to tell you, church, you can trust them. You can rely on him. You can lean on him. With everything that you are, everything that you do, you can lean on him with your total weight. All the weight that is on you here today can be transferred over to him. And he won't buckle. He won't bend. He won't be surprised at your sin. There is no sin too far that he would not forgive. Stand with me this morning. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. The area of trust and stewardship. Father, I pray, reveal to us here this morning, Father, the work that's needed in our lives to be done. You are the everlasting. You will always be there. You promised us when you said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we lean on that promise here today. For those that are tired and weary and weak, we pray over them right now in the name of Jesus. That there would be a transferring of that burden and that they just move out of the way and let you move, Father God. You go before us. You conquered every fear. The cross, Lord God, was done completely, Father God, for for our sin, for our shortcomings. And that blood that you shed at Calvary's cross, Lord God, covers those things. And we are grateful here today. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would do what he came to do here at these altars, here at these seats today. We need you. We're not too proud to say, Father, we need you desperately. This generation needs you. Our country needs you. And right now the world needs you, Father. God, Ukraine needs you, Father, this morning. We lift them up to you right now. We pray salvation over Russia right now, Father. Because only you can do the handiwork that it needs. Only you can change, Father God, the heart. Holy Spirit, have your way this morning as we worship you and sing to you in the name of Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lost 